There are no roads here, nothing but trails. On every hand are the everlasting mountains. Between them are deep canyons, immense gorges for hundreds of feet below. In these streams are found the mountain trout. John R. Flippin, 1889. On July 3, 1849, during his overland expedition through Mexico, John Woodhouse Audubon, son of John James Audubon, recorded in his field journal that he saw trout in the mountains of Chihuahua. Audubon was about a day's ride north and east of Nonahuaba in the Rio Conchos watershed. Other reports of native trout filtered out of the Sierra Madre of Chihuahua and Durango in the late 1800s and early 1900s, mostly from mining engineers, railroad workers, and naturalist Edward William Nelson. In 1886, paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope published a note in American Naturalist about two specimens of Mexican trout that he received from Vanderbilt professor Nathaniel Thomas Lupton. Lupton caught these trout in 1884 in southern Chihuahua while en route on horseback to the mountain mining village of Guadalupe y Calvo. Lupton's trout were since lost and the identity of his specimens remains a mystery. According to an 1892 publication, Hermenes de Trucha Arco Iris, Mexico first received eggs of the exotic American rainbow trout from the McLeod Station of the U.S. Fish Commission in 1888. 
The earliest known examples of preserved trout from Mexico are two large fish from Durango that were exhibited by Fernando Ferrari Perez at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. Although several attempts were also made to document the native trout of mainland Mexico in the early 20th century, only anecdotal accounts and a few photographs of native trout have survived. Apart from collections in Durango by Ralph Miller in 1946 and several studies of the San Pedro Martir trout of Baja, California by Barton Everman and John Snyder, the most significant work on the trout of mainland Mexico in the 20th century was conducted in the early 1950s by Drs. Paul Needham and Richard Gard. Their collections and studies led to the formal description of the Mexican golden trout in 1963 and preservation of specimens from the Yaqui watershed in northern Chihuahua, south to the Rio del Presidio Basin in Durango. Dr. Rick Maiden from St. Louis University, an ichthyologist interested in diversity and biogeography and evolution of fishes, especially freshwater fishes. Our group is called uh, Truchas Mexicanas. It's a binational group composed of scientists from the U.S. and from Mexico. Some are professionals, academicians, some are with uh, state and federal agencies. Uh, for the last 10 years, we've been investigating the biodiversity of trout in Mexico. So the original goal of our project was to try and determine what the biodiversity of trout uh, might be in Mexico. The area that trout occur in Mexico is Sierra Madre Occidental, above about 6,000 feet, um, has not been inventoried very well by scientists. They've made some collections of many plants and animals, uh, mainly at road crossings that would be deemed uh, safe areas to sample. But this, the Sierra Madres are, uh, at this elevation, or have been historically problematic for people to do scientific research because of two primary factors. One is just gorilla activity in the mountains that uh, there are a number of people that historically have had trouble in robberies or something even worse. And then uh, the other problem is they grow drugs in this area. Cuando eres un estudiante de posgrado, no uses drogas. Don't do drugs. There really no, were no roads to access much of this high elevation terrain. And so uh, as the logging industry developed in Mexico, they generated roads. And as the roads came, then people started moving in, and that gave us access to, uh, to the different uh, headwater streams where the trout would occur. Originally, we came down for Tom Larry to illustrate the trout. He's uh, well known for his uh, drawings of trout and we wanted to pick up samples of the Mexican golden trout and these other unknown taxonomic entities. And we uh, started in northern Mexico, uh, hitting some of the, the, the Yaqui system, the Mayo, and over the last 10 years uh, we have gone from basically knowing only one species in all the Pacific drainages of Mexico, a couple of records from other drainages of unknown taxonomic status, to at this point we have found, we're estimating 12 new trout species from Mexico. Something of, a, of importance here is that uh, all the trout are of rainbow trout lineage. And all rainbow trout, most of them, there are a couple of them in uh, interior basins in the United States that were formerly Pacific Granges, but all rainbow trout are native to Pacific Slope Granges. And through our project, we've discovered two new species from the Conchos, Upper Conchos Drainage, one in the Northern Conchos and one in the Southern Conchos. Of course, the Conchos drains into the Rio Grande, which is an Atlantic Slope. So these are the first records of trout from the Atlantic Slope. And through this process, uh, 
of the 12 species, two of them are uh, incredibly endangered with population sizes of less than 300 adults that we've estimated. So you fill out your form then you have to wait for one of these windows to open up and then you pay your fee there and you're on your way. on a little hill to defend themselves, they picked the others off and then they uh, barbecued him up on that hill. They call it the Cerro Juan Matortiz. That was the end of him. Baby Cinco. Stace. <laughs> 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 I'd say it was probably one of the worst steaks I've ever had in my life. I think I burned more calories trying to cut that steak and chewing it than I actually ingest it. Seems to be the problem here. Well, we're looking for Rancho El Salto. Cindy Toll or Tole owns it. And we're asking the locals and it seems to be a lengthy discussion. I would think they either know where it is or they don't, but nothing's ever that simple in Mexico. Until today, um, the rate that we were traveling on the roads to get around was basically the rate that a cowboy would be taking on his horse. Well, the car's only going about three, four miles an hour, and uh, we can, the horses can keep up with us when the cowboys are on the, riding on the road because of the roads are so rough. So it kind of, that's the first time I never thought about that. It kind of put me back to what it must have been like prior to automobiles and roads uh, for somebody to travel. It's a pretty rough night. Um, luck. It's one thing to have cows at a distance, but uh, sleeping on a ranch where their cows uh, 100 yards away, uh, they talk a lot at night. <laughs> yes, sir. How'd you sleep? Um, like crap. Why? because of this damn cow all night from like 3.30 on. Moo, moo, like every 10 seconds. I was ready to just kill a cow last night. That's not your sleep. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> How come? That damn cow. <laughs> Hurry, How come? That stupid cow. <laughs> Great. Never hurt the cow. <laughs> Liar! <laughs> so, but Bernie never sleeps, so he's, uh, he's a road warrior. And loves driving, loves doing the shocker, loves his field notes. He just, uh, he is the leader of the A team, I'd have to say. I fall somewhere in the B minus, maybe C team on the sampling. He's in much better shape than I am. Yeah, we'll let you know when we find the road. We're, I guess we just kept going up the hill. Well, I don't know where we are, but it's beautiful. <laughs> I, I know in front of us is uh, Mesa de Huracan. What was the line in the movie once about the guy who said you couldn't track a muddy dog across the clean floor? I think that that's kind of the situation we got here. <laughs> if the guy that knows where he's going make sure that the people that don't know where they're going are always in sight here. Piece of road that's kind of nasty here. I think we better just use the four wheel drive vehicle.
¿Dónde están las truchas? No, aquí por el río. Sí. O sea, si salen por aquí, de repente hay la trucha. Muy profundo. Sí, no es en lo hondo. Sí. Ahí. En vez de allí del rancho para allá, salen trujitas ahí para allá, por el arroyito. Ah, arroy arroyito. Sí, un arroyito. Sí, ok. Ahí. Well, uh, we got a 12 volt battery on it and uh, has a lot of controls on it for voltage and amperage. And um, put the anode and cathode in the water and it creates an electric field that it's a mild electric current in the water and it sort of paralyzes the fishes temporarily so you can scoop them up. So it's really useful in streams like we've been working. With a lot of cobble and boulders where if you try and net them they just go down in cracks and sometimes when you shock them they go down in the cracks <laughs> as well so you're fishing about with your hands but it beats dynamite and poisons and so forth you have very little mortality of the fish they may be stunned just temporarily and then then they're off and going Got it. Nativa. Nativa. Okay. Trucha Nativa. <laughs> the biggest one yet. Binky, time for some photos. Seven. All right. Wow. These are the... Uh, unique identifier tags that we put on the fish. Right now we put them in clove oil, with, or put a little clove oil in the uh, bags, and that's sort of a natural anesthetic for the fish. And uh, they uh, relax, they're pretty much out. Take a fin clip for DNA, and then we preserve the specimens for uh, further analyses of the morphology. But we make, we make these gill tags that we put in the fish uh, when they're preserved so that we have a one-to-one -one linkage between uh, specimen and the DNA, which is going to go in one of these tubes here. It's got a corresponding number here that corresponds to the number on the gill tag. Ideally, we're these preserved specimens will end up taking measurements off of them and if the fish are preserved straight with their fins up it's obviously easier to get measurements than if you have a curved fish or a fin that's flat up against the back or a mouth that's wide open. So if we preserve them in this pan before we put them in the jar then we have better specimens to take morphological data off of. So that's the whole point of this. If we see anything odd with the uh, morphology or the genetics, then we can go back and look at the other data set to see if there's any corresponding uh, variants. Uh, whether we've got hatchery influence here, which I seriously doubt in this area, or um, more than one species at one locality, those sorts of things. What are we fishing for here? Mexican golden trout, Ocarinchus chrysogaster. Is there anything particular? Are they, they hard to catch or any particular technique? You need to use? Uh, I'm, I'm just using a small nymph on a, on a lightweight fly rod. Any, any different than any other trout? Uh, other than tending to stay up under cover a little bit more. Not not much. Trout's a trout. It's a trout. So what do you think? What are the colors like that? These They're pretty spectacular. It's probably the second best in North America. The, the golden with the uh, tinge of orange, then they've got a purple lateral band and big blue par marks that are just spectacular. Uh, what's the biggest we've gotten? Maybe eight inches? You seen any bigger ones? 
sure there's a couple in here. A little bit. A little bit larger. Oh, oh, there's yeah, one that's yeah, probably yeah. 10 inches or so up under that boulder, but uh, we haven't been able to trick him yet. The white tips on the fins were about that far apart, which uh, would mean that you'd have a fairly stout trout. Couldn't ask for better scenery. It's a uh, spectacular country. What about the company? Oh, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you spend all these, these resources with funds and energy and planning and logistics. And then you may go three, four, five, we even had one trip into the Conchos where we went the entire trip and didn't get a single trout. And you know, that can really take some wind out of your sails. So you, you really have to be motivated and you, you've got to have a few high energy people to get the rest of the troops going. Well, as usual, we hike a thousand feet down into a canyon and we're having chakra problems. We don't think it's the battery because it's beeping, but it's not sending out the current. So, we're getting ready to throw it in the river, but we're going to try and fix it first. We won't have to carry it back out. Well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> so, if push comes to shove, luckily we got a few stone rollers and a few Gila minnows. Um, Arnie and Dave can catch a trout if uh, push comes to shove. Oh, yeah. That's what I know. Okay. So, Neely, where the, where's my trout? Somewhere in the river. No good, huh? No good. Not today. Maybe tomorrow. It's real easy just to, you know, or lose steam and just hang out and camp and, you know, not do too much. Yeah, that's true, especially given that none of us are getting paid to do this. Okay, we're not getting a salary to come down and work on Mexican truck. This is all, I mean, we all have jobs, but it's not like we're getting extra money to come down for these expeditions. This is something that all of us our heart of hearts wants to uh, you know, work with and, and discover what's going on in nature. <laughs> what's your bag rated for? Minus 15 Fahrenheit. And I was cold last Thank night. Thank you for <laughs> specifying that. <laughs> That's right, not centigrade like Rick's, but Fahrenheit. Yeah. <laughs> the limited number of actual full-blown species there are in North America is due to the fact that people that work with the taxonomy and systematics of trout they're sort of anchored in the biological species concept, which basically says if, if, if two populations can interbreed, they're the same species. And if you see morphological differences or ecological differences or behavioral differences, they're not a species level difference, they're a subspecies or race. Over the last 20 years, most of science has moved away from the biological species concept and moved to a more inclusive concept I guess the phylogenetic species concept would be the definition that's most commonly used now. And it's, it's, it's much less restrictive than the biological species concept. Uh, just think about it. Most aquatic organisms, they differentiate in different river systems. And typically those river systems flow either directly into the ocean or into a very lowland habitat where, where trout would never intermingle. So you have these trout that, that never interact with each other. So as they differentiate and become different species, what would be the natural selective pressure for them to not interbreed? There, there, there's no reason for them to develop these mechanisms to stop interbreeding because they're in isolation from each other. Hey, yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> We're at uh, Rio Nonoava at Nonoava Chihuahua, Mexico. See, it's pretty easy to get to, huh? Oh yeah, a good <laughs> two hours from. Um... <laughs> Estamos en el arroyo Rituchi buscando matalotes y apariques. Hemos encontrado un poco de matalote, pero aparique no todavía. Esto es Arroyo Arena. Sí. Sí. And we're here to catch apariques. This is in the Rio Conchos Basin, really the last great stronghold for the Conchos trout. Maro works with the ejido. We're working with the ejido for conservation area for trout. 
y estamos pagando un vigilante para que la gente no pesque con plantas venenosas en el río y se tiene algunos acuerdos para estar buscando proyectos y apoyar a las gentes que viven cerca en las localidades de elegido para que tengan algún otro ingreso, alguna otra forma de hacer la vida un poco mejor. No sardines and no cigarettes. The top thing on my list is you just have to be totally prepared for just about anything to happen at any time. It's like, what the hell was that? <laughs> a couple minutes went by, and then we heard about six or seven. It sounded like a semi-automatic to automatic speed. Uh, <laughs> Hector goes, vamonos, vamonos. So that got me a little nervous when Hector's getting nervous. Uh, solo vinieron los policías que estaban revisando por armas y drogas anoche y estuvieron preguntando que, qué hacíamos y ya después les expliqué que es, veníamos haciendo un estudio de peces y de la vida que, que había aquí en, en Chihuahua y ya pues, fueron ellos. I think that's all. <laughs> This trip, eight days, a matter of, well, probably a matter of four days, we lost four tires and have them repaired. Anyway, just put a new set of tires on them, okay? It should be a brand new tire. Well, that can put you out. So now we carry at least two spares with military checkpoints, non-military checkpoints. People that are interested in what's going on in the area, don't know what you're doing here, that have a weapon, and they stop you. We, you run into this all the time. Um, there's some set military checkpoints on the highways and then these roaming checkpoints here in the rural areas. And they're just basically looking for drugs and guns. A couple of times we run into um, some of these uh, military checkpoints where they've we fit a profile, I think, and they've been pretty serious about us and really gone through the car carefully. The rest of the times it's just these cursory um, checks and it's pretty obvious I think that we're not drug runners. You know that's why you really need to know how to speak Spanish so that you can explain what you're doing. He says there's a spring on the water surface he said. So it's a lot of water. So I don't know maybe if we can get there he didn't seem to know how to tell us to get there exactly. As young as I can remember, my father loved to come up the mountains hunting and fishing or camping. So, so I've been driving these roads, I guess, for 50 years now. They haven't really changed a whole lot. Generally, you know that the main traveled road will go to the large, larger settlements, and then there are little roads, the logging roads that. Uh, can take off in different areas, but uh, once you've been over them several times, you get your bearings with the landmarks, the high mountains, and the rivers, the areas, and so basically you know where you're supposed to be headed and which direction you should be taking to, to get there. And there are numerous roads that you could take the wrong one if you weren't exactly where or where you wanted to go. So uh, we're on the wrong trail. Uh, one of the many logging roads uh, we took, um, we thought it was the right one and it's a dead end and ended up down at, at essentially no water. So now we've got to go back up and reconnaissance, look at the maps and GPS and talk to some people if we can find them. But um, that's why I bring at least two or three versions of Mexico maps because they have different roads on them. So, you know, when we first got into the conchos, we didn't find any trout. And then we got into the conchos and we actually found some trout. 
And now, many years later, we're back in the concho. The roads haven't improved. They're just horrendous. Um, when the road's relatively flat, it's got this talc powder on it that just gets everything super dusty. And if you're not doing that, you're going over boulders and bedrock. Um, yeah, they're the worst roads in Mexico, I do believe. Fun, do you think? No, but I hope it's not a leaf spring. That, or uh, could be a shock. Put that on the list. Got it on the list. Oh, shit that needs to be repaired on this truck after this. Now, for me, the, the challenge is one, the roads. Not only from a point of view of flat tires, but some of them, they're almost impossible to travel on. We've uh, had experiences where we've had to with our larger truck, winch up a smaller truck up the side of a mountain on a road. Um, and then number two, I think, is just the physical aspect of some of these canyons that we have to hike down into because there's no road access in the streams at the bottom of the canyon. They're uh, 1,500, 2,000 feet. And you, it's just not, you know, you put on your day pack and you just, you know, hike down the canyon, check it out, take a few pictures and hike back. We've got backpack shockers, we've got formalin jars, we've got waders, we've got cameras, uh, we've got all this equipment that we've got to get down into the bottom of the canyon. You've got to have the appropriate light to get good photographs to document the color of these fish. And then you've got to get back out of the canyon before it gets dark. And, you know, doing that once or twice on a trip is fine, but um, when you're going for eight or nine days, camping, not getting much sleep, and a lot of this physical activity, um, those rocks are slippery down there, um, it, 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 it can be physically fairly challenging. We're at Cabrada de Navarro in the Conchos River Basin, and we came down this really steep canyon to see what we could find in the way of truches. Um, it was probably over a thousand feet, um, and the first three or four hundred feet, we didn't have a trail. It was pretty interesting. Then we hit a trail um, and made it the rest of the way, and it wasn't too harrowing. The habitat, when we first got to the stream here, it looks really good. Um, some nice plunge pools, uh, boulders undercut, uh, really good trout habitat. But as we move downstream, it narrows into just a straight sided canyon and it's just a series of scour pools on bedrock. So our guess is during high water, when trout could potentially get up here, there's no way they could get through that uh, torrent of current through that narrow canyon. Saul is our guide and he's a great guide. He's done a wonderful job keeping us all alive. It does get rough after two or three days where you don't get any trout and uh... You're having trouble with your shocker, you're having trouble with the truck, you're having flat tires, you're getting sick, whatever. And that's, that paints a pretty rough picture. But, but uh, the area is still yeah, gorgeous. Absolutely. And the people yeah. are extremely friendly, except for an occasional yeah. guy that's mad with a gun. But other than that, you know. Yeah, and as Bernie says, you know, it, it also, uh, things that add to it is the fact that the people are so wonderful there. You know, we've met so many very nice people and people very interested in the aquatic ecosystems there. People willing to open their doors, let us come in and sleep in their homes or camp in their backyard, so to speak, at their ranch. We've never really worked with the uh, Uraramari or the Taramari uh, out in the field, but we've met many of them and uh, I know they're interested in the, uh, the native uh, trout natural diversity there. So. That's extremely rewarding, I think. I think that fish is talking to me and he's saying he stinks. <laughs> the fish is saying it stinks. You're the only thing around. So. <laughs> That's true. Now, are you going to take this back and get it framed, Joe? Or? Oh, it's going in the book. You're going to hide this. <laughs> A lot of the. Um, local people, we don't have to educate them about the trout. They, they know what the trout are, they can differentiate stocked rainbow trout from native trout. And the gila is stocked. It's interesting that we will go and we will talk to them, they'll say, yeah, there's trout you know, up there in the stream. We'll go there, we won't find any. We come back, they're like, oh yeah, I guess that was 20 years ago that I found the trout there. And and I, I don't know if, if the disappearance of trout locally 
sort of sink in because if they were there 20, 30 years ago, if, if the person alive today can remember catching it, then the trout are still there. But uh, the matter of the fact is they're disappearing and, and hopefully we can bring awareness to the local populations that, that these things are disappearing and from some of these systems they're disappearing permanently. And if we don't try to moderate uh, the use of this resource, it will be gone forever. Sí. sí, en Zaporiachi no hay matalotes. El señor Luis dice que solo hay sardinitas y encontramos campos tomas, codoma, gila y es todo. No hay más pescados. Sí. April 5th, 1906. My dear Nelson, Meek, on the authority of a railroad man who is interested in Mexico, says that trout occur in Pacific drainages west of the city of Durango. He further says that Mr. John Ramsey, another railroad man of that country, says that trout are abundant in an upper tributary of the Yaqui. Is either of these places the one in which you know trout to occur? Respectfully, Barton Everman. April 6, 1906. Dear Everman, the trout sighted by Meek from west of the city of Durango were also located by me during my work in the Sierra Madre there in July 1898. They were seen in a small creek at El Salto, Durango. Sincerely yours, E. W. Nelson. P.S. I regret exceedingly that I failed to get specimens of these Sierra Madre trout, but that does not help us any now. Walter Bishop was an avid outdoorsman, wrote the guide to the birds of Durango, and fished extensively for trout in the mountains of Durango for more than 70 years. His father, Walter C. Bishop I, installed the first telephone lines in the state and was U.S. Vice Consul to Durango in the early 1900s. In the fall of 1907, he caught five specimens of native trout in the Presidio watershed and shipped them to Nelson at the Smithsonian. Everman intended to describe these as a new species. He never did. The disposition of the specimens is unknown. ¿Qué es esto? Catán. It's an alligator gar. All right, baby. You uh, had paint, had draw this uh, alligator gar, will be much better than this one. Charrones. No está bueno. <laughs> Solo pruébalo. No es tan bueno. And take some Pepto Bismo. No me gusta el Pepto Bismo. Oh, you have worked with Mexican wool. That's what I work with. Oh, over it? wow. Are there any left in Chihuahua? Well, some people say there are, and some people say there aren't. They actually may be down in this country more, if there is any left. That's neat. I'm E. Brooks from Nuevo Mexico. <laughs> I'm here to make Dave Probst look good. <laughs> Which isn't hard. <laughs> Dave Mealy, St. Louis, Missouri. I'm glad to be here. Oh, yeah. So you better catch some trout, Dave. Oh, that's a given. Okay. Got a shocker. Yeah. <laughs> Walter Bishop uh, was telling me, he says, he said when he was here with Miller in the early 40s, with well, he Miller's right dad, right he was down here working, and the guy at, at El Salto told him to guide this Mr. Miller, it was um, Robert Rush Miller's yeah. dad, to oh, guide him around to the streams. I didn't know Robert Rush's dad. Yeah, he came down here. The early collections mm -hmm. of trout from the Presidio from uh, Miller. And, uh, did Bob ever get into this country? He probably did at the bridges. Yeah. That's what Dean said. Si, si, si. ¿Cuál es su nombre? Miguel. Miguel. Mm -hmm. Jorge. Jorge. Dave. <laughs> Alejandro. Alejandro. Okay. This is a Chilango. Chilango? Yeah. People, people live in, in Mexico City 
Oh. We say Chilango like, like a New Yorker. I know? see. The same thing. I see. Okay. Chilango. Since 1964, the trout of the Rio Culiacan drainage have been lumped in with the Mexican golden trout. The Culiacan trout appear to be genetically and morphologically distinct from the populations of golden trout that we've seen in the Fuerte and the Sinaloa basins, so they might constitute uh, a different species. There's a waterfall on Arroyo La Cidre in the San Lorenzo system that really makes this area unique. It separates the hatchery rainbows that are abundant below the falls from a unique strain of native trout above. And there are many other streams in the San Lorenzo that also have native trout. And the local folks say that these trout have been in the arroyos as long as their families have been in the area many, many years. We haven't yet accessed the remote northern reaches of the San Lorenzo, but expect that that area may also have a native trout. The native trout of the Rio Piasla watershed are closely related to the San Lorenzo trout, but they're really markedly different in appearance. Like the San Lorenzo trout, they have many par marks, and more so than any other trout that we know of. Some populations of Piasla trout are very heavily spotted. And as far as we know, there are no hybridized populations of this species. When we came back, I stayed there with George and uh, Charles, because you guys stayed up at La Cedra. You went on to San Lorenzo. So we go back to the hotel. We're in our room. We hear this noise. So we went down the end of the hall. And I knocked on the door, and the guy opens the door, and it's the it's the local band, and they're practicing about <laughs> 10 o'clock at night <laughs> in the hotel. Yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. It's uh, second area of the road, dirt road, and go up to Neveros, where there is supposedly a road, an even worse road, a dirt road that goes over to El Gato. Okay. But the word is this road might not be very good. Trout were first mentioned in the literature from the Presidio watershed in the late 1890s by Edward Nelson of the Smithsonian. The canyon itself is about 5,000 feet deep and you could guess that it's pretty difficult to get a handle on the distribution of trout in the arroyos. That's where all the trout are. They aren't in the main stem river but are up much higher in the colder tributaries. But Walter Bishop did tell us that he and his father used to catch two different kinds of trout in the Presidio, one in Arroyo La Rocia and another in Cabrada de Vega and some of the other headwater trips. Walter made a big contribution to science because in 1946 he helped Ralph Miller collect trout in the Presidio watershed. Ralph was the father of Robert Rush Miller, who later authored The Freshwater Fishes of Mexico. Arroyo La Rosilla. Sí. Es un arroyo chico. Sí. Que tiene 
fondo de arena y algunas partes rocosas, sí. con poca corriente. Sí. Y desemboca en una presa que fue construida tiempo atrás. El descorriente es muy poquito. Muy poquita corriente. My biggest surprise today is the beautiful little trout that are found in the Rio Baluarte watershed. And I think the coloration here is unique among all trouts. We made our first collections of these trout in 2004, but uh, unfortunately, as in so many other arroyos in Mexico, there's a suggestion of hybridization here also. This is probably that's a new species. The, the closest thing this looks to me down here is Mexican gold. Now we have found trout in the Rio Capaneta headwaters, which is as far south as we've looked to date. And genetic work on these trout suggests that there uh, could well be a native trout in the Capaneta that has been hybridizing with rainbow trout that are escaped from grow out facilities. So are there native trout south of the Rio Capaneta? Uh, we have anecdotal evidence of trout in the uh, Rio Mescatal but haven't been able to get in there yet. A bridge, structural bridge designed by a non-civil engineer. But it works. There's a certain element of machismo uh, to trout fishing. Uh, how many trout have you caught? What's the largest trout you caught? Who caught the largest trout? who has the finest rod and reel, etc. As a result, over time, humans have become accustomed to catching or wanting to catch large trout. So on the one hand, a sport fishing, and on the other hand, people eat trout. And especially in Mexico here, trout uh, in the Sierras and many other areas of Mexico is an important source of protein. But we have a genetically modified trout here, essentially. And this trout grows very fast. It gets much larger than the native trout. Years ago, they started to put in uh, these grow-out facilities where they get larvae or young fish from Mexico City uh, up here in the mountains. And so the, these grow-out facilities would rear them to a certain size and people would come and buy them. So this has become a legal and safe way of providing income to many people in the Sierras. But the water's now flowing through uh, large pipes into a raceway that has been constructed out of cement and local rocks. And in this raceway, he's rearing uh, hatchery trout that are, originate from Mexico City as little fry. They come, bring them up here, grow them out, and then they sell them. Most of these raceways are not of the type that would prevent these hatchery trout that are non-native from getting into the uh, natural stream. If the government would put in a little bit of money to do research on the native trout, perhaps you could be almost as successful in these hatcheries using the native trout and then you wouldn't swamp out the, potentially swamp out the gene pool of the native trout with these introduced rainbows. And a lot of these hatcheries uh, throughout some of the states, they're actually built with state money and the state actually promotes the uh, grow out of these introduced rainbow trout. Everything we got up there looked like a native, above the falls, above the hatchery. What do you think, Joe? Introducida. Mm. Yeah, it's introducida. That's what I would say. But maybe it could be hybridization. Hybridization could be native. And the native trout will uh, all of a sudden be in ex coexistence with a an alien species, and there have been a variety of, of, of studies, especially in the U.S., where you've had uh, hatchery trout mixing with native trout, or you'd have two different trout species, like the cutthroat and rainbow, where they're mixed by humans. It always leads to a problem. One is the hatchery trout grow faster and get bigger, they eat a lot more resources. Uh, the hatchery trout also will interbreed with the native trout, so you start losing the, quote, biodiversity that is naturally inherent 
in the streams of Mexico that may be unique to individual streams. These things are incredibly different from each other. In fact, these Mexican trout are uh, adapted to a warmer climate than trout are in the U.S. They have genetic makeup that's quite different from other trout, which is another interesting sideline of research in itself, what genes are actually being expressed that allow these trout to exist in much warmer waters than would occur in the U.S. or in Canada. Previous researchers who studied trout in Mexico were in total denial of the diversity. Um, and there's been a, a long-term uh, effort by some people to basically call all rainbow trout the same thing. And uh, that's definitely not the case. John, your feet a little close to the edge. Pretty close to the edge there. I got a good hold of a tree. I'm not going to turn this away. <laughs> I think they had a sawmill here in this area and this was the foundation for their equipment. They would put out their big uh, bandsaw and it was powered by uh, steam engines. And I'm sure that these old buildings we see around here and all of this was part of their, their sawmill operation. Mm. You can see it's located in an area surrounded by a lot of good timber. So they probably, when they first put the roads in here, hauled out an awful lot of, of nice timber. And, We can't ask the Native Americans in the Aikido who cut down the trees to make wooden bowls to sell for a living to stop chopping down those trees to conserve uh, the trout. We, we've got to give them an alternative. And the alternative is, is going to be money-based, whether it's to bring in some other jobs for them to do or pay them directly to not do what they're doing that's dam damaging to the local environment so, so they can just get resources some other way. And, then, then thirdly, um, from the educational point of view, if we you do not have the political will in Mexico at the state level to try to manage these grow-out facilities for rainbow trout, in 15, 20 years, this will all be for naught. Every, potentially every stream of Sierra Madre will be full of stream chickens. And so I think an educational tool like this could educate enough people, the states in Mexico would have the political will to change business as usual with these grow out facilities and number one, try to restrict their locations and number two, put the resources into using native trout as an alternative source in grow out facilities. Eight, ten guys working across the Sierra Madres over a thousand kilometers, it's going to take us a really long time to truly know the distribution of these species, which ones are critically imperiled, uh, which ones aren't. So we really need resources to increase the manpower and increase the amount of time that we spend in the Sierra Madres collecting these data. Of course, no one's, the right people aren't here to authorize, you know, the same old. Hopefully with time and education as we're trying to uh, with many aspects of our study that uh, there will be a time when um, we won't have as many hatcheries uh, or grow-out facilities in these areas or at least we could have them localized to streams where we know there's already been genetic integration with the native trout and let's try and limit the uh, damage or prevent any future damage to other native populations and maybe even start using native trout for propagation in localized areas and get the people interested in their own natural heritage of uh, the native trout in the area. So uh, that's one of my dreams that uh, hopefully will be fulfilled uh, before I die is that the people will appreciate the natural diversity here and uh, the native trout will live in coexistence with the uh, Mexicans, the Taramaris, and other uh, Indian uh, tribes, races in this area. You know, I haven't had Spam. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, I haven't had spam since 1983. Mmm, spam. It's better than dog food. They both have their waders on <laughs> still. <laughs> Joe wants to know if you're expecting high waters. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, they got, they got cutthroat slash. Very few spots. What? See? Yes. Is Watch this another one of your jokes? No. no. Totally we got different. the proof. And we never lie, you know what? Right. <laughs> What's up, buddy, Rick? It's the cheese pie, la vida. <laughs> That's great. Off <laughs> to a good start here. Yeah? A donkey got his head in the trash can where we had dumped the uh, leftover from the evening meal. He <clears throat> was eating spaghetti out of the trash can, but he got his head stuck in there, and he was running around with his head, this trash can on his head. There you go. You eating all our trout? <laughs> aparique? Yeah. This is aparique. Aquí? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now it's a joke. Sad. <laughs> Holy cow! Yeah, we shot a videotape for videotape. Woohoo! Goodbye, Joe Tom Larry. Guy or Gooey, he is sitting in his underwear. And it's like 25 degrees outside. <laughs> by the campfire, laying on his side, wondering why all the trees are sideways. So here's where we talk about on the morality. Board. Not morality, sorry. Moral. <laughs> no. Yeah, morality. How's the morales? Morale. We're talking about morale. I wouldn't have missed this for anything. De Nuevo, Mexico? Si. Okay. Nuevo Mexico. Bueno. Next. Next map. I uh, volunteered for this book. <laughs> we went in there and the, there was this strange smell. And I said, Deacon, I said, what's that smell? And Dean said, oh, they swabbed the floor with a mixture of diesel fuel and insecticide. <laughs> Make sure it's that clean. That was clean. <laughs>